So as it happens at these things, it's dangerous to not go at the top. I had a story about five billion years, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll dispense with that. But I will say that that framework that David gave us uh, is entirely appropriate to the exercise we're engaging in, which is really trying to take a step back, as Tina encouraged us to do, and look at something from the larger scale, long term, that is in so many ways how we actually find our place in things as opposed to being quite, quite close up and not engaging fully. So in some ways it's a tribute to Dr. Kandel's work on memory uh, and the, the ideas of short-term memory and long-term memory and what we actually can absorb and we'll talk about that I hope a little bit. <clears throat> but overall we're looking for the ways that, in fact, that, that phrase, what can we do together? What can we do together right here, right now, that we can't, in that framework of creating allies, of long-term strategy, of things that will have impact over the very long term? I already have a question uh, from Dr. Kandel. <laughs> it just terrifies Perhaps me. Perhaps I can begin the discussion. <laughs> uh, I think the major development in biological sciences uh, in well, let me take this back. One of the great uh, developments in the biological sciences in the last half of the 20th century was a merger of cognitive psychology with brain science to give rise to a new science of mind. Before that, psychologists were really not willing or able to get involved in brain research. And brain scientists thought psychology was just soft stuff. They didn't realize that this is the basis of human behavior. Mm. And that synthesis has been very important. It's given us a new science of the mind. I think what we're going to see in the next 50 years <clears throat> is that brain science becomes sufficiently powerful that it begins to understand the nature of art and of music, how we respond to works of art. And I think this would be very marvelous because many people think that science is in opposition to the arts, that it somehow detracts from your enjoyment of music if you understand why you enjoy it. And to me, that's just silly. The more you understand of something, the more you enjoy it. And so I think we're likely to see, and we see beginnings of it, to see a coming together of certain aspects of, of music and of uh, visual art and brain science. So that, that leads us to that level of understanding of how important understanding actually is and how that relates to development over the long term. And I was going to start, um, Dr. Rice, first of all, I just have to say, wow. Just, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. I mean, just ex extraordinary. Uh, and, you know, I was, I was listening and watching. I was thinking about uh, a fellow who was uh, the late Hugo Fiorato, who was conductor at New York City Ballet, who once took us sailing uh, on a weekend at New York City Ballet. And he said, you know, to be a conductor, you have to be a good sailor. And that, that idea of conducting diplomacy and watching you navigate was really uh, just a privilege. So thank you for that. What I was going to say, though, building off of Dr. Kandel, is growing up in Birmingham in a time of great cultural change uh, and societal change and, and discord, and that influence on you, I'm wondering if that you could speak a little bit about the cultural impact in that way of how that has shaped your development and to this day? Well, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I was born in 1954. I'm 62, so you don't have to count. Um, and, um, Thanks. I, yes. And Birmingham um, was, of course, the most segregated city, in, a big city in the, in the entire country. Uh, it was called in 1963 Bombingham because there were so many bombs, including the one at 16th Street Baptist Church that killed uh, one of my kindergarten classmates, Denise McNair. But the remarkable thing about Birmingham was that this little community that I grew up in called Titusville um, was all about faith, family, and education. And I might add, and the arts. Because uh, the arts were a way of keeping the kids um, uplifted so we all had lessons of some kind, ballet, piano. Uh, I remember even taking tap dancing lessons once, which was not particularly successful. But we had, <laughs> we had the arts. We had church. And the music was the center of the church. Yes. My mother was a, a very fine pianist and organist. My, my grandmother was a piano teacher. And my great-grandmother had played. Uh, but at my, little, at my father's little church, my mother was the church organist. Now, what's interesting mm. about this 
is that she challenged this tiny little church choir to sing the great music. I can remember this little choir singing The Heavens Are Telling by Haydn. And so the arts were very much a part of, I think, almost a coping mechanism mm -hmm. in this cool. uh, community that needed ways to have an uplifting experience for their kids. So it was faith, family, uh, and education, and I would say the arts. And the arts were big in the schools. Uh, we had uh, marching bands. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I am saddened by, I'm so happy to see what's happening with the arts here in the Savoy Kids, which is amazing. The, the band was a place that uh, the kids went, they practiced, they worked hard at it. And so it wasn't one of these things that we sometimes see now with mm -hmm. kids, oh, let them all get out there and run around and have fun and it will be cubed. Well, actually, no, it's not. It's much better if they've practiced and they know what they're doing. And then um, I would be interested in what the, the neuroscientists think about this, but I think achievement has got to come from actually realizing you've mastered something, not simply getting out there and uh, pretending that you have. So it, I grew up with a very powerful culture of achievement, powerful culture of you can do it, a powerful culture of there are no victims, a uh, powerful culture of you have to be twice as good, mm -hmm. but also a supportive culture that gave us uh, access to everything, including uh, to the arts. So interesting. You, you framed it so beautifully, first of all, but you, you fixed it for us at the end. You made it very neat. Mm -hmm. But I want to pull out the idea of work, hard work. Mm -hmm. And I also want to pull out the idea of need, yes. that, you, that fulfilled a need yes. in the community. Yes. Uh, and that, to me, speaks of depth that there's actually deep, deep strategy to it. It's not nice. Right. It's, it's about need and it's about work. Um, Dr. Kendall, let's go back to you just for one more moment on that subject. I want to read a quote of yours that might relate. Me, my God. Yes, well, it's actually, <laughs> actually, it's, a, it's you quoting someone else, actually. So let's do that. <laughs> The biological function of art is that of a rehearsal, a training in mental gymnastics which increases our tolerance of the unexpected. Mental gymnastics which increase our tolerance of the unexpected. Ernest Gombrich. Uh, can you, can you, that to me is, we're talking about resilience here. Right. We're talking about training for resilience, if you will. You want, could you talk a little bit about that for well, us? Um, I think this is what life is about. Uh, here I'm living in Vienna, having a perfectly comfortable life, and Hitler marches in on March 13, 1938. My complete life has changed. Yes. And fortunate enough to arrive in the United States and have this privileged existence. That's resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, our family realizing we have to get out. Where can we go? How can we manage it? My mother is sending my brother and myself. I was nine, he was 14, off by ourselves. Mm -hmm. On a transatlantic ship, I'm afraid to have my grandchildren cross the street by themselves <laughs> at that age. And my parents had the resilience, the foresight to do this. But this is probably true in all of our lives at one point or another, that we make major steps forward that we're not quite completely prepared to do it, but our previous training allows us to project what we need to do in order to manage that successfully. Yeah, it's some, the, I mean, and so there's it, different... In, in science, you're doing this all the time, right? You want to go into the unknown. Uh, you can speak about this better than I can. And to be able to have the knowledge that, you know, you can do this and to have some idea of where you want to go is a key to it. I would just like to extend our discussion. I think <clears throat> the kinds of exercises you had, kids playing piano and ballet, should be extended to science as well. I think kids should spend time working in labs. It's very different to reading a textbook. I've written a textbook. It's boring as hell. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing the like working in the lab. There's, you, know, you see the gossip that goes on. You, you, do, you work with your own hands. You see little you know, new things emerge. It's very, very exciting. And I think kids ought to have an opportunity. And I encourage this. I take high school and college kids into my lab. A limited number, don't, by all means, don't start <laughs> applying, please. Uh, uh, because I think it's a wonderful experience for them, and it's also pleasant for me to see a young person coming along and being turned on to science. Can I add? Please. Not only in the labs, but up mountains. Oh, even better. To look at the sky. You know, mm -hmm. children in uh, inner city Chicago think the sky is where the planes cross. They don't see the galaxy. They don't see the stars. They don't know what's out there. Even that wonder that, you know, get goosebumps, just like when you're playing. 
uh, what we get when we look up and see our own Milky Way and we see other galaxies if you, have, um, if you happen to be in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and that is something you don't need words, you just have to experience it. And um, you know, that's how you get started too in sciences and in art, I think, by having goosebumps at something. I want to I want to build on that in one in, in a little bit more. But so the idea that we're talking about, we're going to talk a little bit about the unknown. I think we should go in that direction because you just framed it vast, vastly to use the cliche about the vast expanse. But that idea of getting your hands on things that you're describing, Dr. Kandelik, we all saw it with the Savoy kids. Um, Yo-Yo and I have privileged to be turnaround arts people who have worked with those Savoy kids over the years and watched Carol Foster talk about someone who encourages the hard work and raises the level and says, no, we're not just gonna, we're not just gonna do this for niceness, we're gonna do the Haydn, we're gonna go all the way. And that idea extends obviously to science, but then they are in that moment facing the unknown. They had to perform, there was a, you know, that, that feeling, and I remember that well when I was dancing on the stage, that really there's a moment when you wonder, is this actually gonna work? Um, uh, Dr. Rice, you may have had that just moments ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So perhaps, Angela, could you talk to us a little bit about facing the unknown, that idea of it, and what you would hope to bring to us from a depth experience that, uh, uh, you know, you take it from there. Um, so first, I think we're all humans, right? And this is something that you know, the emotions in this room today are just unbelievable. And scientists tend to ignore that bit uh, as much as we can, because uh, if we want a result from our experiment, uh, we try to push it too hard in that direction. So we are trained to be a bit cooler about uh, science because, you Controls. know. Controls. Otherwise, we get the wrong answer. <laughs> But, um, but inspiration is what makes us want to be scientists. So it is the same uh, you know, beginning and it's the same goal. It's the goal to do the new. Uh, it's the goal to play a new piece. It's the goal to figure out out there when you look up in the sky, what's happening out there? Why is the universe infinite? Where is it going? What is this dark matter business? So yeah. I think we're all very much um, in the same boat if we have the freedom to go explore the boundaries. So I was saying he was a fluid that can go and check what the boundaries are. And we're doing that in art and we're doing that in science. And I think this is what makes us so much more um, brilliant than computers in a way, uh, because we have that ability to keep moving the boundaries and keep wondering more and more. And every time we do in science, ask, uh, ask a question, get an answer, we get another question immediately. And I think in art, that's the same process. We are trying to push the boundary of uh, what human is through the arts, and the new art is always the challenge, not, I mean, we can adore the previous one, but a new interpretation of an old piece is always uh, what makes goosebumps again, right? So I think uh, that exploration and that challenge is what brings us all together, and just to give you why an astrophysicist is sitting here, I love to use art in my astrophysics class, because that's one way to communicate um, what we've done in science, without writing the equations right away. Somehow equations don't seem as attractive as paintings. I haven't figured out why. So we start with paintings. <laughs> Interesting. So the idea of boundaries uh, and, and the human instinct in my mind, what I'm hearing is to challenge those boundaries in a consistent way, which speaks to motivation, like why we do anything. And that perhaps is intrinsic uh, to all of us. So why don't we talk a little bit about that in terms of how, how we motivate ourselves, because I think that that, again, fits into the idea of what the short and long-term motivation is. So I'm going to turn to my friend Paul uh, and say, so Paul, you, you're, you, know, in, you do many things, but you do represent on this panel in some way the business world and success in the business world. Uh, and we have spoken a lot about why we do things, and I've asked you specifically about you know challenging the idea of short-term profit as you know it, because it being directly in contrast to long-term progress and how does that framework work for you in the context of what you've heard so far so if at all you know, as, a, as a lifelong entrepreneur I would I would echo some you know you've got themes of hard work 
you've got themes of curiosity, wonder. I grew up in a household. My dad was a geologist, and his great hero was Richard Feynman. You know, yes. and uh, my mom, uh, who hitchhiked to Sweetwater, Texas, when she was 19 to fly B-17s. You know, you, there was no such thing as complaining in our household because there was nothing to complain about. She had hitchhiked to Sweetwater, Texas, from Pelham, New York. So, but you grow up. Uh, but she was a poet, and so I grew up on T.S. Eliot and Wendell Berry, and my dad talking about Richard Feynman. So when I thought about business, it ultimately was what. What are we celebrating? T.S. Eliot talks about we shall not cease from exploration. At the end of all our exploring is to arrive at the start and know the place for the first time. We've talked about that. That was something that was on every desk in my office, right? Because the, the greatest danger, I think, in, is to think that culture is something over here and business is something over here. Okay. Business is as much part of our cultural you know, imperative, our moral duty of care as anything else. And so how do you create cultures of trust? Yo-Yo used to say the currency of culture is trust. So I realized that the, the key to being an entrepreneur was to create cultures of trust because that's where innovation came from. Those were the sustaining factors. That was what made it a living company. And if you could do that and maintain what we would call a beginner's mind, right? Always maintain your curiosity, your sense of wonder, your sense of possibility. Because the great enemy, I think, of great business and the great enemy in our public policy today, which is where it took me, is certitude, right? You know, that is the great enemy. You know, when we grew up in the enlightenment values of curiosity, wonder, possibility, discourse, uh, the minute you think you know it all, you're gone. So the thing that kills business, and therefore culture, because ultimately we're all citizens, right? Business is about, is a composite of citizenship, is that the minute we think we know it all and you become complacent, you've lost, you've lost the plot, right? So I think business in my world was, how do you maintain a, a commitment to disruption? How do you maintain your beginner's mind, your sense of, of wonder? And that that innovative spirit is something that is deep into our core as a culture. And, uh, and the short-term problem is, is that we live in a world now where there's more and more pressure to deliver every 90 days. David certainly knows this. And you lose your sense of stewardship of a longer-term enterprise, right? And I think we have a duty of care to be vigilant about that and not reduce everything to earnings per share and 90-day quarters and stock buybacks and dividends, right? Where's the investment in our future? I think that idea throws the burden back on culture, frankly, to, to make that case for the long term, to actually place it in that, uh, in that uh, framework, just like the framework of the sky places us in another place in, in, on the tiniest blip on that yeah. frame. Could I, could I just pick up on that? Because I think one thing that unites uh, what I've just been listening to, which is fantastic, you know, there's something in us that wants something to be enduring. Right? We, we want not to believe that when we've left this earth or when uh, that n nothing mm. endures. And indeed, uh, when you talk about businesses, I had the pleasure, the, the great joy really, to sit on the boards of two companies with the founders. So Hewlett Packard with both Dave and Bill, and uh, on the Schwab company with Chuck mm. Schwab. And there was something about those founders that they had decided they wanted these to be great companies for a long, long time, not just immediately. Mm -hmm. I think about the sky, that's enduring. You know, mm -hmm. One thing that it reminds us is it's been there for millions of years and... Uh, and 13.7. 13.7 to be exact. Thank you. Give or take. Thank you, I can now, I can now quote that. But I think, I think great, great music yeah, and the great arts have that same character. They're, they're enduring. Yes. Uh, when you listen to something that was written almost 250 or 300 years ago, and it still stirs you, there's something that's really quite, uh, quite satisfying and indeed aff affirming as a human being uh, that that can be the case. Could I and just ask, I mean, so uh, analyst calls are just every public company CEO's nightmare, but I used to drive them crazy because they'd say, so what's the, you know, what's the strategy? And I'd say, I'm building a Japanese sword. You have to heat and fold and hammer a thousand times because you've got to build something durable. Otherwise, if you do it shortcut, you get a cheap, brittle piece of metal, which has no enduring value. And that drives them crazy. But after a while, you know, they begin to realize that if you're really committed and the whole enterprise is behind that, you've created vision, commitment, passion, something sustainable. Even while trying to be disruptive. Absolutely. They're one and the same, actually. There's one aspect one of this we have not touched on, which is implicit in everything we've said. And that is, in addition to the enduring quality, there's something that is creative in all of these efforts. And the pleasure of creativity is remarkable. I can have the crappiest little idea, and I get such pleasure out of thinking about it, just advancing the field a tiny little bit. And I'm sure this is true with all of us. There is enormous satisfaction 
in being creative. And I don't mean, you know, yeah. Beethoven or Mozart. I mean on a very, very modest scale, you know, candle of creativity. <laughs> and that's, you know, that speaks of a, a willingness to fail. To say, I'm going to be creative, even if it's crappy. I'm just going to, to go no, I, there. I, I, well, I, 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 because I, I think that's a, you, that's a, that stops yes, a lot of people. Yes, but I'm saying one gets pleasure out of ideas, even if they're very modest. Yes. Because it's very, very satisfying to develop a new thought, a new way of looking at something. Understood. And even if they're wrong. So usually, when I have a new idea, I you have one right day right. before I actually write the equations down, because most likely it's going to end up in the garbage <laughs> can. But I want to enjoy that one 24-hour <laughs> pleasure. Oh, that illusion. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. Fear of, so, failure. Fear of failure is a terrible problem in business environments, because you get cultures of, you know, nobody wants to take any risk. It's, it's all about risk, right? So part of building a corporate culture that is sustainable is you've got to have the trust. It's back to this culture of trust. You have to know that your great disruptors are going to be the ones who are failing all the time. That is the only way you get success. If everybody's safe, we have, you know, we're not going anywhere. So that's a very but key as point. As you point out, hmm. successful business people are immensely creative. They have Absolutely. new ideas. They move the market in new directions. You know, it's no different than science. 100%. So we haven't heard from Yo-Yo yet. And no, what I want to talk about is your idea. So this is, this is Yo-Yo's idea. He could no. be sitting here with, you know, singers. And you know, we could be doing lots of artistic discussions. But you chose this. You wanted to have this discussion. Uh, how do you feel? How's it going? <laughs> I'm loving it. This is amazing. Because this is everything I could possibly hope for, is to hear all of you discussing something that we all have in common. And it's, it's the ideas, how you put them into action, whether they're valuable at a specific time, whether they can actually, you know, ideas. I'm a factory of ideas. Whenever I practice or play, it's, it's like you can't stop me. And this is so frustrating for everybody that works with me. <laughs> They're over there. Including my family, you know. And, and so, because, and one of the problems is because I travel all the time. And when I travel, you, you're opening yourself to all the influences of a different place, of a different culture, of a different set of habits. And so if you're going to read it well, then you have to be open. And, but once you're open, the problems start. Yes. Right? You're so you're trying to be open. You want to be open because it's food, and it feeds your, your capacity for ideas. And, but it's unsettling. It's unsettling. But there's a, the side benefit of being an accidental cellist, of being Waldo. You know, you get placed into places. And guess what? I meet you guys. Mm -hmm. I met you at a party. As one does. <laughs> <laughs> I met Dr. Rice uh, when uh, we, I played, we played at Stanford. We played together. You, you could call me Condi. You know? Oh, Condi. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on first name basis with her. Okay. Uh, and so, um, you know, you were provost at, at Stanford, and you said, I love Brahms. So you love Brahms? And I want to ask you, why do you love Brahms? <laughs> and why do you turn to Brahms during moments of greatest difficulty? Yes. Mm -hmm. May I start first, though, not to go off script here, but to tell you how I actually met Yo-Yo Ma? I'd because, love that. Because it's actually a very interesting story in taking risks. So uh, I was provost at Stanford. You played at Stanford. Um, after the concert, I came back. and. And Yo-Yo says to me, um, Stanford's at the university. Stanford, Stanford's the, the university on the West Coast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and by uh, the university. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I, I said to uh, Yo-Yo says to me, uh, you play the piano, don't you? And I said, well, I used to play the piano. I said, I played. Yes, I play the piano. I said, and he said you know, you and I should play together sometime. And I thought, right, you and me, we'll jam. Sure we will. <laughs> uh, I thought it was one of those kind of throwaway lines uh, that people say nicely. So when I was national security advisor, my secretary said, um, Yo-Yo Ma is on the phone for you. I said, uh, you mean the greatest living cellist? And she said, yes. 
And uh, he said, I'm getting the National Medal of the Arts, and I thought we might play together. Now, I'm National Security Advisor. We have a few things going on. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, uh, yes, I'm going to play in front of 2,500 people at Constitution Hall with Yo-Yo Ma. Sure. But we did, and that's how we decided on Brahms. And um, I said that I love Brahms because Brahms is passionate without being um, sentimental. sentimental. Mm -hmm. And I also love Brahms because Brahms, you can see that it was a struggle for Brahms to compose. You know, he actually threw a lot of his works away that he didn't think were good enough. Let's just think about that. He struggled to compose. People struggled to perform him. It's like a wrestling match with Brahms when you're playing it. And so, to me, it's, uh, it's a wonderful way to think about life. You can overcome these things, you can struggle. The struggle is part of the joy of playing Brahms, but uh, that's why I love uh, the, great, the great Johannes Brahms. And do you know why I called you? Because I checked out what you said, because you said, you know, you have Brahms on your piano, and what I knew is that I met members of a quartet that Condé played regularly with in Palo Alto, yes. and then I found out that in D.C., when she was national security, uh, had um, NSA, she also had a quartet. So I knew that this was not, you were not, you know, a fly-by-night pianist or whatever, that you really... <laughs> not one of them. No, no, but she was really serious and really committed. And so it was an accidental meeting in a certain way, but but there was substance to it, which, you know, I, but whereas this guy, <laughs> it was crazy. We, we sat together at a, at a dinner and, and we just kind of talked and became friends. And this guy really knows his poetry. He really has the most energy of anybody in the world. And he is involved in, first of all, trying to fix the debt while he was doing so many other things. Arts, culture, politics, business, it's all in one person. He lives it. And we just met, like, you, you know, literally at a dinner. You, I met because you married someone I really like. <laughs> <laughs> and we met through friends. So, right? So it's all relationships. This is all about serious. And relationships. Can you see how wonderful he has been to uh, physics and cosmology, you know, the history of the universe. So there are a few <laughs> dead bodies, there are a few dead chalices that became brilliant scientists thanks to Yo Yo. One of Hogan. them, a friend of ours, uh, he wanted to be a chalice at Harvard and met Yo Yo and decided to do cosmology and he's doing brilliantly. <laughs> Another oh, one, he's, a, he's a biochemist, also run into. <laughs> wanted to be a chalice, ran into you at Juilliard, uh, Tom Comber, and yes. he also became a wonderful scientist. So it's you've done like a lot of It's steering the competition to <laughs> Try science. <laughs> Try science. <laughs> Such a giver. <laughs> yes. You know, so another word that I keep sure. hearing over and over again is know, what we know. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what, what we know is, is our philosophical underpinning. Is what, what, that's what we base things on, what we actually know. And then from there, we can you know, build off of it and perhaps take risk and find ways to extend ourselves and look at those boundaries. So we had a little surprise, speaking of surprises as well. Dr. Kandel, I know you wanted to show us a few things. So if you'd like, that might be a moment, maybe we could know something and then we can build off of it. And well, there it goes, just like that. OK, I, I, we've discussed some of these issues, but maybe I could emphasize new aspects of this. Do you see this line? Yes. Um, the person who really uh, sort of ticked me off in my thinking on a lot of these issues is C.P. Snow. Uh, in a very famous lecture in 1959, he is both a physicist and a novelist. He said the humanities and the sciences you have to are uh, click something. He no, he, he has it, but he has it, but we don't. Right. So just Should one I? moment. I'm sorry, it didn't move. Should if you could, as they say, it's, it's not advanced. Let me do that. Let's escape. And do yes, it again. something's happening. I can't do. But not really that yet. There. Technology. No, but that's. Can you click there? As always. Yeah. Well, we need a new technologist on the panel. Wait a second. Let's do one more. 
There we go. No. no it's, not, it's not advancing. Yeah. Um, he, he, he's not connected to me, so I don't see how it could. Yeah, it's connected through the cable, but it's not advancing. <laughs> well, while they're fixing well, it, it, Dr. If, Kendall. If you can't get it going, it's not terribly important. <laughs> it was going before. Yeah, it was working fine earlier. Uh-huh, it's getting there. Uh, maybe it's a, um, can I suggest to check? Is it working? Right. Speed like revolution. How many scientists? Yes, it's right. Well, I, I ah, yes. Ah, yeah. bravo. Uh, C.P. Snow said that the uh, sciences and the humanities are in two separate worlds. They uh, have different aspirations and different goals and different methodologies. Uh, and they have a very difficult time sort of communicating with one another. Uh, and he had modified his view after a while, but it was clear to many of us from the very beginning that this is really completely incorrect. Uh, to begin with, there are certain aspects of science that are quite humanistic. What can be more humanistic than the brain? You know, it's how you think, how you feel, how you love, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was studying learning and memory, and to me, you know, this is an extremely important humanistic question, so uh, brain science does address that. And the other thing, which it may not be completely obvious to you, but many scientists, particularly modern, uh, I'm sorry, many artists, particularly contemporary artists, are extremely experimental. So they're constantly trying, you know, new kinds of pigments, new kinds of ways of presenting uh, the work of art to move from figuration to abstraction involves an, an enormous amount of experimentation. So uh, I just want to give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, I've been interested in the problem of learning and memory, which is really you know, fundamental uh, to human existence. And um, it clearly, it's, it's a very important piece of information for our culture to understand how we learn. And I used a reductionist approach in order to study learning and memory. I thought to try to figure out on a cellular molecular level how it works in the human brain would take you know, a few thousand years. It was unlikely that I was going to be able to live that long. So I took a kind of approach molecular biologists have been doing. I found a very simple system, a marine snail, that had gigantic nerve cells, only a few thousand of them, and that I could work out a behavior in complete cellular terms. So I could record from the sensory neurons of, the, of this behavior, from the motor neurons, it was a simple reflex, and I could work out exactly how the normal behavior works, and then I could modify the behavior. And I found what happens when the animal learns. Hmm. What I found was, this is a reflex, sensory neuron making a direct connection to motor neuron. If I stimulated the tail, I could enhance the reflex. If I stimulated the tail once, I produced a short-term memory, remembered it for minutes. If I Stim I'll remember that. <laughs> That's the tail stimulus. If you, <laughs> if, if you give repeated stimuli, you learn it better. You remember it for longer periods of time. And then we could look to see what was happening. We found when you stimulate the tail, we activated a modulatory system, like the modulatory system you have in the brain, serotonergic, cholinergic, dopaminergic. And this acts in this reflex. And it acts to strengthen the connections between sensory neurons and the motor neurons. If you give a single tail shock, it's a functional strengthening. The chemistry of the synapse has changed, but there's no anatomical change. Now, Cajal had said this in 1910, but no one had been in a position to examine it. So clearly, we could begin to see that the way nerve cells talk to one another is altered as a result of a short-term memory. And what do you think happens with long-term memory? With long-term memory, you actually grow new synaptic connections. Mm. Now, if you remember anything about this roundtable discussion, it's because you're going to walk out of this session with a somewhat different head than you walked into this. And how does this occur? That's because you're altering gene expression in these cells. That is extraordinary. Now, some people get nervous. Some of the young ladies and some of the gentlemen get very nervous when they hear about this. They say, you know, tonight I was planning to go home and sleep with my partner because we want to have a baby. There can be changes in gene expression. My poor baby has to remember the drivel that this guy from Colombia is coming out with. <laughs> Not to worry. 
this alteration in gene expression is occurring in specific nerve cells of the brain. It does not affect the sperm, and they give my permission to do anything you want to know. <laughs> oh, my God. So thank you so much, Dr. Kandel. I think we've got this. We are now. We're now your students. I, I want to just make one other point before I leave. I won't, I won't do it with slides. As brain science has gotten stronger and stronger, and of course there are thousands and thousands of people all over the world working on this. This is not a single uh, group of people working on it. It's become possible to begin to address uh, really cultural issues. So we're beginning to get some early insights uh, into uh, how people respond to works of art. And I think that's very interesting. And one of the really fascinating things emerged is to look at the difference between how people respond to figurative art versus abstract art. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, if you just think about it, with abstract art, there is much more left to your imagination. So one of the things that really happens, is it invokes, it really recruits your creativity. And one of the reasons people enjoy abstract art is because they're filling in the details that the artist left out. He purposely left it ambiguous. That's essentially what I wanted to say. That's interesting. I feel like I'm playing simultaneous chess here. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to come back to Dr. Rice and say, so with that knowledge, I'm wondering, first of all, your, your reactions to that. But also, when we think about knowledge, I mean, in your uh, uh, extraordinary career, you're, as a Russia specialist, steeped in the knowledge of Russian culture. I wonder how much that came to the table, in a way, and, and whether you wish you'd known some of these things in some of your Summits, previous well, summits. <laughs> I want to take his class. That's all I can yeah. say because that's that's absolutely fascinating. You know, it's it's interesting when you talk about culture and the responses of people to various uh, events or various kinds of representations. Uh, I can hardly wait for. I hope I'm alive when some of that work plays out because one of the challenges I think we have in international politics is that we are dealing with a lot of different cultures. And my frustration is that nobody can af actually define for me culture. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to, I don't mean cultures in the arts, I mean my culture is Russian or your culture is, uh, is uh, Israeli or your culture is Asian. The reason we can't is it's become a residual category to explain things that we can't explain. So political scientists, whenever mm -hmm. they can't explain why people behave in a particular way, they say it's culture, right? <laughs> That's the culture. And yeah. my belief is, in, after being in many cultures, is that it's somehow, over time, a collective memory of things that have happened to people. It's a collective memory of responses of them and their nation to various uh, things that have happened to them, some good, some bad. Some cultures are therefore more optimistic than other cultures. The Russian culture tends not to be a very optimistic one. And so uh, I'm interested in trying to pierce through this idea that culture is controlling when I think we really are talking about experiences that people have had, collective memory of those experiences. That I can deal with much more easily when I'm negotiating because I can say, oh, I understand where that comes from. That comes from a shared memory of what Adolf Hitler did um, in investing or in circling the city of Leningrad and killing one million people. That I can understand. It's just Rus Russian culture that they're not very optimistic actually isn't very helpful. So I'm excited that we might eventually begin to understand how people I, respond I to things and why. And as a Jew, I feel this particularly. I mean, imagine I'm perfectly comfortable in my elementary school class in Vienna, and all of a sudden Hitler comes in, and one of my friends walks up to me and says, Kandel, my father said I'm never to talk to you again. Isolated in school. I mean, it's amazing how people can listen to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven one day and beat the hell out of the Jews the next. Mm -hmm. Incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. And how these deep-rooted uh, opinions, attitudes evolve, and how difficult it is to get rid of them is one of the great problems that faces us. And I think one, if I could say one, one thing about this, I, I, again, because I travel all the time, I have to constantly get inside the minds of other people in order to do my work. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so either a dead composer or a living composer, but for the people I play for, yeah. what does the child think? What does the teacher mm -hmm. think? What does the administrator think? And what is, you know, and, and, and I think that the idea to 
Cundy's point, if I may call you Cundy, is that, uh, that, that to be able to find something that the Russians are particularly worried about. For example, being invaded by the Mongols, like in 1200, that is in their memory. Or, or for, for people in the Middle East, the Crusades. That was like yesterday, right? So the, the time yeah, of culture yeah, yeah. is so, and for us, we can hardly remember what happened yesterday because we're on our half hour schedules and we, we're, we're so busy, but you, we don't think that for other people, something, for Jews, like we've always been attacked. Yeah. When's the next yeah. one coming, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like, so if you actually know something that is not just things that happen, but something that's really treasured. But because as a result of, there's a cultural reflex to the fear, and if culture is truly resilient, they found a way to cope with those fears, but we don't know what those fears are. And if I could just, uh, it, it almost always is also reflected in their arts. One of the great thing about looking at people's, different peoples through their arts is that the arts will reflect their greatest fears and their greatest uh, mm -hmm. joys. And uh, I have just a very quick story on this. So um, I am a great fan of, of Russian opera. And um, I had the opportunity in the 80s to attend a Boris Godunov, the great Mussorgsky opera, in, at the Bolshoi. And they used the Kremlin bells that actually oh. coronated uh, Boris Godunov in, because there's a coronation scene. But at the end of the opera, uh, the libretto is by Pushkin. At the very end of the opera, the, the chorus sings to the crowd, to the uh, people, weep, weep for Mother Russia, weep for she is poor, weep for Mother Russia, she is sad, weep for Mother Russia, she will always be Russia. Now to an American, this is like, wow, uh, that's kind of a downer. Um, and then <laughs> the amazing thing is these people in 1984 or five, whenever it was, they start to weep in the audience because they know the story. They know the time of troubles is about to begin. They know there are going to be a hundred years of civil war. They know that they will be invaded over and over again. They know that the country will be pulled apart. And until you have that moment with them, you don't really, and I saw it first and most profoundly uh, through Boris Gudinov. Can I change a, a one more aspect of cultures? Um, so I have 16 countries working together to put a telescope, which is right now in the Pacific Ocean, trying to make it to South America. And, um, and that's sort of uh, a complementary view of all the cultures. Um, my difficulty, most are men uh, as opposed to women. And therefore, when we get all together, um, I have to figure out which side to kiss, the Italian versus the French, but then the one from Algeria, I better not even touch. You know, there are all these, uh, so for women, it's a little bit more difficult. Men don't have so many challenges right, in right. saying hello. Um, but the fun part <laughs> is that we all about, with all these different cultures, you know, I'm from Brazil, I like to samba. Those, some folks, you know, cover their women from top to bottom. We all wanna know why is the universe the way it is? We all want to look at that sky and have that same goal. And I think that's brilliant when we can find, and I think in art we can find the same um, unity within all these different cultures of the unknown and of the fact that we're all sharing this beautiful planet and we better take care of it. I hope that becomes part of everybody's culture soon too, but it's still a challenge. I would say, you know, having built, we now have 186 offices in some 50 countries. And over the years, everybody would say, well, why didn't you send Americans from our New York office to go run these offers because they had no clue what was going on locally. And, and we were very contrarian in that we did not have an expat sitting on top of offices. We always found the most disruptive local, right, that was the most American in our mind, who was sometimes they were the, the unusual folks in their local communities, but those became our local leaders. And I remember somebody asking us why, you know, I asked a, a Japanese person why we were so successful in Japan. In Japan, in a meeting, if you ask a question, the natural American response is, I'm gonna give you that answer right away and show you how smart I am. In Japan, you have to observe the courtesy of respecting the question by giving silence. So there's a moment of quiet. Now these make for very interesting meetings that are very not American meetings. And one of the reasons that we did so well was that we, ne we let the silence be. And we learned the art of silence. It, was, it made us enormously successful in Japan. So it's these little things, but it's respect and it's a sense of, and that's what, you know, so our American idea went to Japan, understood its view, and became our most successful office in Asia. So I, anyway. I think you're not doing justice to one important point. Mm -hmm. 
and that is how immensely creative business people can be. Just amazing. Yeah. I think there's you know, a lot of strands hanging here about knowledge and responding to need of various kinds, of understanding uh, culture both within your own culture and in, 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 in an alternate culture that you're dealing with. Uh, and I think we're talking a little bit about the atavistic qualities of, of, of history that come back, which I think we can explore further. Uh, but we're actually going to now, uh, we're going to remain, but we're going to have uh, a cultural meeting of another sort uh, as an interlude now. Uh, so we're going to welcome Hadi Eldebeck and Sergio Assad, who are going to uh, perform. Thank you. By the way, he's my friend who married her, so. <laughs> can I say? So, um, this is a piece, Sergio, you wrote. Um, menino means what? A child. A child. And yeah. you had a brother. Yeah, I had a brother that had a, a problem, a mental problem. And he was mentally retarded, and he remained as a child all his life. He passed away a couple of years ago. But had a wonderful life, because he was a child all his life. And uh, this piece was written for him. He has a pure soul.
Hadi and Yo-Yo Ma. Now, just as we are expanding our thinking and creativity, we're about to expand our panel. So we're glad that we can add to the conversation with another set of perspectives. So let me talk about the folks that will be joining us. And when I'm all done, we'll ask them to come and join us up front. So we are so thrilled to welcome Professor Olivier Ullier, neuroscientist and creator of the Neuromix. Jessica Goldman Serebnik, CEO of Goldman Properties and founder of Goldman Arts. And our good friend, Afa Dworkin, president and artistic director of Sphinx Organization. We're gonna ask them to please join us up front and we're gonna expand our conversation. Okay. 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 We're increasing our, you know, by, by hundreds of percent. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. So, Yo and Dr. Kendall rejoin us in a moment, um, but welcome. Uh, so, this was technically what we had talked about was this was going to be a response. But I would consider it an elaboration, perhaps, is the way to look at it, to add some more layers of, of, of viewpoints on. So Jessica, uh, we spoke a little bit about uh, underlying philosophy the other day, about how what your family has created in neighborhoods through, creative act, through creativity uh, has become a philosophy. Um, so I, my question was really what I told you. What is that philosophy of courage that you think changes uh, neighborhood, let's just say, but even in a larger framework through creativity. Can we talk a little bit about so, that? So, um, yeah, of course. Um, let me just begin by saying I feel like I'm home. I do. I feel like I'm home. I mean, being around all of you that really appreciate and love and admire 
art and creativity and what it brings to the world is pretty inspiring and, and exciting. So I thank you very much, Yo Yama, for finding Wynwood and finding me. So thank you. Um, so my family, I come from two very entrepreneurially thinking people. Um, my dad was known uh, very much as a visionary thinker in the real estate world, and the reason being it was because he had tremendous courage, tremendous tenacity, and he always saw the positive in everything. And so we go into neighborhoods very early on, like Soho in the 1970s, Miami Beach in the 1980s, Center City, Philadelphia in the 90s, Wall Street in the 90s, and we are now in this neighborhood, an amazing neighborhood that if you have not been there, you need to put it on your, on your bucket list. It's called Wynwood, and it's in Miami. And every neighborhood that we've always gone into is, you know, is somewhat hopeless, dilapidated. Miami Beach was called Heaven's Waiting Room when we arrived. Um, Wynwood was a place that I would not walk a half a block by myself. Um, no street life whatsoever. And so, but what was in Wynwood, which I think is one of the most, um, which should be a case study for how to utilize creativity and art into creating emerging and exciting neighborhoods, uh, what was there was street art. And so, what we did was we just took it to the next level. We took, uh, we took areas, we took walls, we looked at walls as canvases. And so, those walls became enormous canvases, buildings. And so we invited the greatest street artists in the world to come paint. And we took an area that was the uh, gravel parking lot and the backs of all of our buildings, and it became the Wynwood Walls. And so the Wynwood Walls is now the largest outdoor street art museum in the world. And from, from nothing, from hopelessness and, um, and I would call it fear, we've created something that we get about a million people a year coming through the Wynwood Walls. It's open to the public, it's free of charge, and it has created a, um, um, what I would call a ripple effect around the world about the importance of public art um, and the importance of, of courage in, in having these amazing ideas. But you know, listening to the panel before, it's not just about having an idea. The, the most critical part of having an idea is the execution of that idea. And so you have to have courage when everybody else tells you you're crazy and you have no idea what you're doing or you don't, you know, doesn't understand it. Um, having that courage is really, really critical to really to seeing that that dream become a reality. So Yo-Yo, I know that you were tremendously affected by uh, by Wynwood as an experience, and I was thinking about that idea of relating back to what Dr. Kandel, you were talking about how we experience things and what it happens to our brains and, and there's a certain amount of that courage is about belief that it, there will be an effect, this will happen. So I was thinking about Olivia, we talked last night about your, your daughters and they're gonna be dancers. They're, they're young dancers, they're going to the next step of, of, of schooling and they're 11 and they are being affected and you're watching that happen by art. Absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. to talk a little bit about that, even as a scientist yourself, this must, you, you made it sound a little bit of a revelation. Yeah, absolutely. What is really interesting uh, in the conversation that have been going on, and really the revelation of this dichotomy that we talk about science and art, and what the brain is really good at is creating boxes. And those boxes are facilitating our lives because putting people in boxes such as scientists, artists, enemy, yeah. friends, emotion, mm -hmm. rationality, is very convenient. But unfortunately, this is not the way our brain is functioning. Because when we look inside the brain, um, there is no such clear-cut separation between what people have thought were rational parts of the brain and emotional parts of the brain. We function along something that is more, that I refer to as immorationality, is intertwined. And I think this is very much what we're talking about here. The brain on its own is absolutely useless. If you put the thing on the table, it's not gonna compose anything, it's not gonna make any decision. The brain becomes something useful as soon as it interacts with a body, a body that interacts with physical, social environments. And what Jessica was just referring to, the fact that some people got inspired by walls. You can be inspired by virtually everything, but you need this everything to be here for the brain to be creative. 
And this is what we've been witnessing, physical, social interaction that have been fueling our system, the way we sense things, and the fact that from these sensations, we've been able to create art, to create science. I often said, the first thing I said in my classes is, hi, my name is Olivier, I'm a scientist, and I'm absolutely not objective. And that's, <laughs> yeah, because science is all about choices. We make choices all the time, and those choices are really the reflection of how I sense things, of my knowledge, of course, but similarly to Yo-Yo learned some technique, very, you know, the classical technique, and Eric has been the pioneer in understanding how some parts of a brain are functioning. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I'm sure that they share something, which is in the middle of the night, on a train ride, in a conversation with friends, yeah. some ideas emerge, be it a new melody or the idea that, well, motor neurons will interact with other cells in the brain. And this is what connects us all, not the fact that for convenient reasons we've been put in boxes. No, it's the fact that this brain allows us to interact with the world. And this is how, um, given that we have a Nobel laureate uh, here with us and uh, one of my masters as a neuroscientist, Eric Kandel, uh, I'm more here as a DJ because, uh, yeah, wow. you're right, you're right. Some textbooks are so boring <laughs> that I wanted to take my science, our science, and my love for synthesizers out of a box, out of a room. And synthesizers are just oscillators. They are physics, there is science in them. So I started to connect um, new technology called neurotechnology that allows to record the brain activity of people virtually everywhere uh, these days, and we've got some that you're playing with today, and to connect that with systems that project things on walls, and uh, this is a coincidence, but it started in Wynwood mm -hmm. 15 years ago uh, when I was doing my postdoc uh, in Florida during the day and uh, DJing at night and performing. Uh, if only my boss back then knew that. But, no, but you played it, under, you did it under a different name. Yes, but that's, that's another story, and that's the... <laughs> no, but that's, that's the sad side of this dichotomy between science and art. Because for many years, I thought that being a DJ would be something that will not be good for my scientific career. So I created an alter ego. Uh, had I been a classical performer, everybody would have embraced me as a scientist who, on top of everything, is a classical pianist. Huh. But I was an electronic artist, uh, and uh, it was difficult. And for years, I've been having a life, a day life as Olivier, and a night life as uh, someone, my alter ego, called Jacques Lavoisier, who... <laughs> okay. All right, let's stop it right there. One <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. second. Um, <laughs> Alpha, I, I'm curious your reaction to to Olivier's uh, you know, soliloquy just now about the alter egos and the, the contrast, what he just said, if he'd been a classical musician, that might have actually stood him in good stead. You lead uh, the nation's most extraordinary organization promoting diversity in classical music and trying to make that a part of the life of more people in classical music expanding uh, to, uh, to people who are traditionally underrepresented in the field entirely. So in all of this, you know, and we're talking about short-term, long-term, all of these things that we talked about earlier, what are your thoughts right now? So many. <laughs> I, I, I feel, as I've been listening all morning and hearing Olivia talk, um, one of the things that comes to mind piercingly, Wallace Stegner says that there's a sense in which we're all one another's consequence. And mm. it's the sense of connectedness and while the stories are many, it is just really one. Um, and for me, because there's just so much that we share, so much that is common, and, and the voices that we add surrounding it enrich a single story that becomes so much more rich because so many of us are talking. Um, for me, I was born in the land of less than optimistic people of Russia. <laughs> We've been talking about it. Um, and grew up in Azerbaijan in a household, um, in a Jewish and Muslim household, which um, wasn't a popular choice 
by my parents. <laughs> and and um, so I consider myself a rather mixed individual. And when I was almost 18, I came to the States. Um, and for me, it was a bit of an accidental story too, being dropped into the world, what diversity means in America. Um, growing up, one of the more fortunate things in my very otherwise happy childhood as well was that the arts and music were absolutely an essential part of a young per person's development, regardless of where they came from, without regard to anything, class, race, or otherwise. Um, and it wasn't just aspirational, it was simply part of everyone's upbringing. So um, the idea that one wouldn't be playing an instrument or singing, mandatory singing, um, would be completely insane. So coming here and learning that American orchestras in an aggregate um, embrace only a 4.4% of, say, blacks and Latinos today, so which mu was much lower when I came here 20 years ago, and, uh, and how that compares to representation in our population was just absolutely a wild disco discovery, not in a good way, um, because there's just such a lack of balance. And I love quotes. So I also think of another one. Um, Chimamanda Adichie says that the danger of a single story is not, it's, it's not that it's untrue, but it's just that it's incomplete. So our arts have been telling an incomplete story for a long time. And we're all, I think, in many different ways are trying to complete it, complete the stories, one another's stories and our own through the arts because it is that one common language and absolutely nothing should come in the way of a young person being able to develop that language as their own. So for me, it's a privilege to be able to while well, I'm trained as a violinist, but for me it's a privilege to be able to contribute um, as a part of a family of very creative people who look at reasons why access is such an issue and then nurturing and developing talents that are absolutely deserving um, to be, to have a permanent seat at the table and to be able to be part of that common story. So we, we're going to indulge and take a few, we can take five, five minutes, we got a little behind, a little extra, but I know, so I want to open this up a little bit among the group, asking each other questions or, or commenting. So Dr. Kandel, I see I, I you raising your hand. I think the point that you made, that the brain, marvelous organ that it is, is extremely dependent on the environment, the social environment in which one is reared. Just to give you an example, if you look at the kids in Romanian orphanages right now, they have tremendously deprived. They have language difficulty, they have difficulty walking. Motor skills as well as cognitive development is severely impaired. Uh, and this is, you know, if you have difficulty at home, if your parents are cruel to you or if they don't interact with you, you have brain damage that is very, very difficult to overcome. In fact, a really frightening piece of evidence emerged just recently. If you image people, who've come from low-income families, and you look at the brains of young people, you find that if a, if a boy or a girl was brought up in an environment in which they were really impoverished, the hippocampus, which is critical for memory storage, is dramatically reduced in size. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this magnificent organ, which makes us who we are, is so dependent on social interaction and even on economic factors for its mature growth. And then, so Olivia, I want to go back to you just one more time on the, on the impact of the art that you're observing on, on your children then. How does that, how, how do you see that manifesting itself? I imagine that, you know, just let me know what you think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So uh, I'm the proud father of Sarah and Chloe, who have uh, just been accepted uh, to the National Ballet in France. And, and it was tremendous to see how uh, those little girls who grew up playing, uh, interacting with the others in a very uh, unextraordinary way, you know, in a certain way. Uh, started when it comes to ballet, to see how disciplined they can be, how curious they become about the music, about the environment, the architecture, and it even enhanced uh, some of the social interactions they had with uh, their friends. So the fact that um, in addition to what their the mother and I uh, do our best to give them, um, being able to benefit from the structure 
of classical arts. The rigor of it, of course, gave them discipline, but uh, opened up a whole range of new creative thoughts, interactions. Uh, they started to draw more, for example. Um, they started to be interested in a lot of other things. And it's very interesting because there is, again, these boxes, these stereotypes of classical arts, ballet being one of a less uh, diverse environment. Uh, mm -hmm. w w we discussed about this. And uh, in France at the moment, there are lots of discussions, as you can imagine, about the presidential elections. Wow. And uh, it is when my kids uh, started to really think about this audition that they uh, got us into conversations about uh, the political uh, situation in France. That was absolutely crazy if you think in a very rational, uh, correlational way. But on the other hand, um, they were opening to something else. Uh, their brains were stimulated differently than before, hence they were looking for other kinds of interactions. Jessica, in the, in, let's choose the neighborhood, but we could talk about Wynwood, you know, perhaps most, but up to you. So you talked a lot about the amount of people coming to Wynwood and the, the changes within you know, uh, the, the neighborhood that would have a ripple effect that way in both there and, and on. And certainly I saw it myself here uh, in New York with Soho and the changes that went on there. Talk a little bit about the that changes that he's describing among the people there and, and things that you look for and the things that you hope for that you know in your framework that you're looking for. So I find that art changes people's perceptions and it allows you to open your mind to something that you might not have experienced before. And it gives you an energy unlike anything else. And you know, whether it's music or dance or theater or, or a visual art. And so when I see people coming through the Windward Walls, you know, it, their, their mood changes. You know, I, I do a lot of um, uh, field trips with young children. Um, all age children, and I, I have a big box of colored pencils and pads of paper, and I hand them the paper and the pencils, and I tell them, I say, go find something that inspires you, and sit down, and whether it's, you know, sketch or write a poem or do something, you know, the idea with art for me is to expand your horizons and to think about, you know, the, the amount of creativity that went into that one, you know, that one thing, whether it's a, a beautiful dance or, you know, or a cellist, um, you know, a song, there's a lot of uh, passion and determination and hard work that go into crafting that form. And so I think that putting art in public places is critical. It's critical to the way in which we live and think and so my family has chosen to do that um, in, you know, in a way in New York. We have the Houston and Bowery Wall. And, you know, and so we've chosen to do things like that to bring beauty to the world. You know, and I've heard a lot about legacy and, um, and leaving your mark on the world. And my dad, who passed away five years ago, you know, he wanted to make sure that everybody knew that Tony was here. You know, that he left his mark on the world. And I think that all of us sitting here, we have a responsibility in this world. And the responsibility, at least for me, my responsibility is to raise the platform on which artists have to work. Um, it is to make the world a more beautiful place in, in the small way that I can. Um, and it is to kind of um, make sure that we share our passion for the arts um, around the world in any way that we can so that other people kind of uh, can appreciate and, and take on the passions. Um, passion is contagious. And, um, and I think that that's, a, um, that's what I wish to do anyway. I love that, that, that construct of the passion being contagious. And I think that it speaks directly to the idea that also you providing the paper and the materials, the tools with which actually to enact that mm -hmm. is crucial. So it's not simply a matter of going and viewing. It's not simply a matter of saying, you know, there's so much more to that. And Afa, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that in terms of, of what you do with Sphinx or how you, how you see that in the larger thing, providing the tools and the materials and the, the, the rigor and all of that that goes into, you know, really addressing social injustice, essentially. And, you know, the, the 
part B on that is that, and we've never spoken about this quite in the same way, that you as an immigrant to this country, arriving and understanding race in a different way from that moment of arriving than you had understood it in, a, in another country, I think is interesting in this, uh, in this discussion. Yeah, I think that piece of arriving and understand, actually struggling to understand the difference between what is injustice and what is simply for a variety of complicated reasons, a lack of effort and, and dogged persistence to make something more equitable and just more correct, I think, more harmonious. Um, and for me, it was the injustice piece that spoke so strongly to me. It was the idea that we would deprive any young person of exposure and participation in the arts. And whether that's purposeful deprivation or just a lack of care and lack of empathy, and lack of energy to go in and do something. That just seemed absolutely ridiculous to me. So I did want to be a part of building something that would fix that. Um, and for Sphinx, our, the, the way our work unfolds, it's, you know, we say that our mission is transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. And, and I get the privilege of watching that every day. I see a young person in Detroit picking up the fiddle for the first time and helping them get sized and making sure that mm. the violin fits and having them understand that the sound they make is theirs. It's a voice. And I watch a kid from being almost nonverbal to within, in a matter of weeks and months, being a, an, a beautiful spokesperson for who they are. Whether or not they may end up on the stage of Kennedy Center or Carnegie Hall is not too relevant. What they'll do in life is absolutely essential. So Sphinx, touches lives of young people and addresses the whole issue and notion of inclusion and diversity through a sense of a pipeline. So we work with young people in elementary schools and we call that our overture program. And the idea there is really, this is a youth development initiative. Um, we do so through performance, but it's really to develop young people and have them develop a discipline, an additional language really, that is music. Um, then we have kind of a series of Chima music boot camps um, and that's for young people who definitely illustrate and demonstrate talent, but may lack, and definitely have the affinity, but lack resources. So that, that's kind of more intermediate level. Um, looking at young people who are teenagers, really pre-college, and understanding whether it, it's something they would love to do for a living. So there we provide not only a nurturing environment where they can talk to their peers who look and resemble them culturally, but also being able to work toward an ideal of what they would like to do and what that takes. Um, and then our flagship program being the Sphinx competition, which really um, nurtures the talent of people who've played for a while and now are seeking to develop their careers. So it's really looking at the wholesome musician and understanding what everyone needs um, in terms of career development. And annually, Sphinx reaches 10,000 young people through their programming. Um, we really believe in achieving more through the work of others. So we also have a, a fairly extensive um, artist grants program where we work with musicians of color to try and support their creative ideas, um, not only to de develop their own careers, but how their own ideas may benefit their own respective communities. And it's such and a well thought through depth. Um, <laughs> of building, I mean, so many of the things we talked about, about responding to need, about you know, the depth of knowledge that you can build to a creative place on with the last piece being, you know, how you, how you extended that from, from introduction, from overture to the place of creativity itself. Um, Yo-Yo, uh, any last words for this uh, uh, panel that we've, you know, we've come such an arc here uh, of knowledge and need and collaboration and building allies. Uh, any, any last thoughts for us? Well, I, I had one question for the group here, yeah. which is to say, would you raise your hands to see, uh, so we could see how many of you work f in one way or another for a nonprofit organization? Wow. Okay. All right. So, wow. so here's my question for you guys and for all of us to try and resolve. Because my experience, and I work with a nonprofit also, and the, the problems I think we all experience, and nod your head if you agree with me, and shake your head if you don't, is that we have to spend 97% of our time surviving. Uh, raising money every year, 
yes, and which to the first point that I made, we don't have much time to think because we have to stick to the mission. We can't collaborate because with another organization because there once funding comes up because you, you don't want someone else to talk to your board members. Yes, no, no, okay. Uh, what, one of the things, uh, one of the things I would love to try and figure out, and, and this is a question for everybody, to see whether, you know, of the people that you see here, Jessica, who may have space, various places, right? Olivier, who's kind of uh, really an instigator in many ways, but who can actually help people think through their organizational issues from, from a very different perspective than sort of the nonprofit perspective, right? Uh, someone like Paul, who actually is very well versed and uh, linguistically capable of speaking the vocabulary of a number of sectors, right? And a passionate person like Angela, who's obviously an, an unbelievably competent cultural person in order to get 16 countries to work together on a very expensive project, for, exa for example, right? For example. And Afa, who obviously is doing deep work in, in many sectors. How can, how can, can you imagine how, like either this group, including your group, could actually come together and work in a way that is more efficient, mm -hmm. that helps you solve your problems, other than sort of says, give me money. And can you get to the point where you can actually shift the emphasis from saying, it's not we need, but rather we give, right? So just flip it and see what it would take to do that. And I don't know the answer. That's why we're here trying to discuss these very, so there's no question that everybody's here thinks, gee, it's really important that we do this work. That's not the question. We don't need to reinforce that in each other, or maybe we do, in which case it's all there. We have incredible citizen artists who are actually doing it and who are used to doing difficult things, really difficult things. And those of you that are running nonprofits are doing difficult things, but not with the kind of well, you get scared too, but they're doing it at a younger level, mm -hmm. which is, a, you know, you're, maybe you can deal with more as a younger person. I don't know, but um, <laughs> I sort well, I forget it. Um, so, so for the rest of the day, I would love it if you kind of try and come together because the rest of the day is designed to kind of meet people uh, who actually either have done things or have ideas and capacities to think about things. There's the hall of wonder that's there. And please look at those gorgeous slides that Angela put together, um, the National Geographic uh, donated, that a wonderful photographer, Felice Frankel, did for an incredible scientific, uh, you know, macro and micro examination of the world. And because wonder is where it all starts, right? So that's the, that's the basis. And where can we collectively create this wonder uh, for our population? And what can we do together that we can't do alone? If you can solve that, boy, you're, you know, that's, that's gold, that's pure gold. And any, any points that can lead us closer to that is gonna be great for all of us. Does that 
Perfect. Put it. So that's the challenge. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this, this morning session, and I'm going to turn it back over to Mario. I think we need another thunderous round of applause for all of the morning panelists and performers, especially our friend Damian Wetzel for leading these conversations. Thank you so much.